Okay, we're ready. Okay, ready? All right. Um, just give me your uh, your name and where you're from. Uh, uh, James S. Fletcher from Ostel, Georgia. You remember your serial number? 340-12139. All right. Um, a lot of this is going to be repeats of what we did over at the History Center, but yeah. that's fine. Um, do you remember where you were at and what you were doing when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, well, really, uh, in 1940, they, they thought we was getting in, so they uh, uh, got the draft ready, and they uh, they drew a capsule out of Washington, and I've never been lucky in my life getting the name the first one out of a capsule. Well, the first capsule they pulled out with my name was on it, and I went to Fort McPherson, was inducted January 1941. And I was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. So I was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina when Pearl Harbor was on. Well, really, I was in Atlanta that weekend. It was on the weekend Sunday. Um, what went through your head when you heard about it? Well, uh, the way they broadcast, you know, I went back to Fort Jackson the next day, and they had machine guns set up all over the field, and they had us on the alert like we was fixing to leave. And I thought, really? They're just fixing the bombers up. By the way, everything was going on so crazy. And uh, then uh, President Roosevelt come on and uh, give a speech to we all was in the barracks, and we listened to the him declare war on Japan. Uh, right after that, uh, what happened? Well, right after that, they put us on the alert to be able to move in a few days. They sent us to Key West to guard the coast down there. They figured it might be an invasion down there. And uh, <clears throat> back then we didn't, high folks had wooden guns, and when they took us down there, they tied a telephone pole between two wheels for an anti-tank gun, and we were sent down to guard the coast, and high folks had wooden guns, so we was really unprepared for World War II. Um, what was your original uh, job in the Army? Well, I, when I went in, I went into 121st uh, Infantry K Company. I took infantry training, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and uh, all kind of guerrilla warfare. But uh, before I went in service, I worked for a photographer about uh, nine months or ten months. And for that reason, they checked my record, and they sent me to a signal company in there. That's where I took radio and cryptographic. And in 1942, they uh, <clears throat> wanted somebody that had infant training in cryptographic and radio, so 12 of us was picked for a special mission. And what was that special mission? Uh, well, we didn't know. <laughs> <clears throat> they shipped us, uh, they took, a, it was at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri then. I left for Fort Jackson. And but they, they got us ready and put us on the alert and uh, relieved us of all duty. And we couldn't find out where we go. And uh, I used to go out on weekends and give me a pass before we left. But they shipped us to uh, San Francisco, which was Camp Madal. And from there, they took us over to Angel Island. And by the time we got done, there's eight of us. By the time they got done, there's 120 of us. It was picked from all over divisions in the United States. And they give us training over on Angel Island right next to San Francisco. And on February the 14th, 1943, they took us on a boat over to the pier in San Francisco and put us on a large boat, the USS West Point. It carried 10,000 troops and 1,000 crew. And from there we was shipped out. We still had no idea where we was going. It was very secret. And our next stop was um, Melbourne, uh, Wellington, New Zealand. And then we left there. It was Melbourne, Australia, and they gave us leave. We went in. And then when they got rumors that uh, we was going to Guadalcanal, they was fighting on Guadalcanal then. But uh, then that rumor failed too. We was going to North Africa, where the Desert Fox was. And... Uh, 
Then they told us that we was going to India, Bombay, India. So we landed at Bombay, and that was quite a sight to see India. If you've never been there, it's one of the usual countries of the world, their customs, everything. And from there, we toured uh, Bombay for a day, and they put us on an Indian boat called a Le Jeweler. And uh, it was one of the filthiest boats I was ever in. And I, no I noticed there's loading fruit above before we got on the ship. I said, why are they loading so much fruit on there? And that night they served us bread and something, Indian food, and they cooked loaves of bread, which we sliced, and I thought it was raisin bread, but it was roaches in there. So we eat fruit all the whole time on that ship. We didn't eat their meal they cooked for us. It was a filthy. And we landed at Karachi, India, which is Karachi, Pakistan now. And they took us out to a barracks there, and they held us about two weeks. And then they put us on a train and sent us to Ramgar, India. That's where this train in China, uh, three Chinese divisions. Stilwell had made his retreat out of Burma uh, in 1942. And uh, we were sent there to, uh, for re replacements. And then we got to Ramgar. There was three divisions of Chinese that flew from China. And we was there a few days, and they give us... Uh, Rifles. We before I left the states, they gave me a forty-five to buckle on. When we carried a forty-five with us at all time, and when I left uh, Ramgar, they issued us rifles and live ammunition. One group was going to China. One group was going to Burma, where they were dying like flies with fever. They said, and one group was going to stay in India. And I was supposed to go to China, but two guys got sick uh, going to Burma, and they had to have two replacements. So they asked for volunteers, and nobody volunteered, so they volunteered me and another guy, and I was really sick. And they sent us uh, up to a place named Chabo in Assam, that's northern Samar, on the Tibet border in China. And from there, they, uh, you could see uh, Burma from there over the hills, and from there, they uh, picked us up and put us on a truck and we rode down winding roads all night and we landed at a place called Lido or Sam. It looked like the last outpost on earth. And uh, part of our men that was in that group, some went with the Chinese, some with the British, and they said, we don't hold you here. I said, oh boy, I finally got it made. And one day I looked out and I saw a bunch of, looked like a uh, gorilla bunch come out of the jungle, natives, Knives, big knives, and American leading them. And I, I told one of the guys there with me, I said, I sure would hate to be in that group. The next day, General Boatner posted the order that I was to go with that group of Kachins. And so that's the way I got into Kachins V-Force before I went into Burma. What did a, uh, <clears throat> a southern boy from the country think of all this when he was experiencing it all for the first time? Well, it was all <laughs> new to me to see India, the customs they had, and uh, most all the shacks at Lido uh, was made out of bamboo, a lot of them wasn't. But see, uh, what their purpose was, they was going to, after they closed their, uh, Burma was captured in 42 and they run still well out. They had no way of getting supplies to Chiang Kai-shek but over the hump. And very few planes could get over there. They had a air base in Michina, which they'd shoot down the planes a lot, some crash. So they started building the Lido Burma Road. I don't know where y'all ever heard of it or not. And it was on joined the Burma Road. But I went in there before the Lido Road was built. We left there with uh, several coolies, headhunters coolies, the tame ones. And we went back into. Uh, Burma over the Lido Road, and it started raining, and they were leeches by the million. I never had seen a leech before, and uh, it was quite a sight. And the first river I crossed, I was wading it, and I stepped in the elephant track and went under and lost all my stuff, and they finally re recuperated that. So we went on to a village called about five days across Burma. We was in Burma now, in northern Burma, called the Gap Ga. And there they had an outpost, and uh, Seagrave, I don't know where y'all ever heard of Seagrave, Burma Surgeon. He's got about three or four books out. Uh, that's where we landed it, to Gap Ga. Um, at this point, 
did you feel like your training had prepared you for this at all? Well, back in the States, uh, they give us 20-mile uh, hikes, and some of them couldn't take it, but I was always active, so it didn't worry me too much in the jungle, but some of them, they couldn't take it. And they give us medical kits and add a brain and quinine to take. And uh, But we was at Tegapga uh, a few days, and Kalakga, another village over there, had been uh, uh, captured, and they had massacred everybody in the Japanese, and most of them escaped, and the Chinese had recaptured. So we was taking some of our nurses in there. So we left uh, out. It was the monsoon had started then, and we had coolies carry our supplies. And uh, the farther we went, the thicker the jungle got. I never had seen so much bamboo, some of its largest telephone poles. And uh, our second day out, uh, they uh, shot a monkey and fixed it and gave it to us for our lunch. And I, I didn't want to eat a monkey. It was like eating your next door dog or cat, you know. So after about five days, we landed to Galak Ga. And uh, it was, they burnt down most of the village. There wasn't much there. And, and uh, Tun Shen, one of the natives, it brought the nurses. They built a hospital there. And we was there a few days before they sent us out on a mission. Um, tell me about the, the closer friends that you had during your time with the Kachins. Well, I had a guy named Medlin. He lived at Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, a guy named Peeler and Creel and different ones, but uh, lots of them was killed, uh, but uh, different ones. Out of all the bunch, I guess there's only two of us left now. The original bunch I was in in Berman, 43, me and a guy from Pete Luckham from Dallas, Texas. Um, how often? during the time in Burma, were you afraid? How, how present was fear? Well, uh, I wasn't afraid at first, but uh, we was in, uh, right after we got the Kalak guy, they sent us on a mission to check out, see how our Kachins would work for the Japs to bring us back information. And we went out in no man's land, and our supplies got short, and... Uh, we couldn't get our supplies in for food, and we had to eat native food, so the Kachin said they knew a Nagra headhunter village we could go to. The headhunters, that was in headhunter countries in northern Burma called the Nagra Hills. So we went, uh, took a day's march, and got into that village uh, about noon, and uh, there was Nagras everywhere, and uh, they come out to meet us, you know, and led us back to the village, and we saw lots of women in the paddy field and naked kids, and they were fierce, had knives and spears, you know, looked like Stone Age men. And as we went into the village, uh, that was one of my scariest moments. I saw about 20 heads mounted on the wall, and I said, oh, my God, I'd hate for my head to be up there. But uh, the Kachins told them not to worry. They wouldn't bother us, so we give them a... Uh, we carried opium. They furnished opium with us. That We used that for money, opium. And they all smoked opium. So they brought us uh, two pigs, about five chickens and eggs, and we give them opium and sugar. And they never had seen sugar before. They thought it was sweet salt. And uh, we give the pigs back to them because they told them it was against our spirits to eat them. The reason we give them back, they have a platform on the back of their hut. They relieve herself, and the pigs eat the human waste, so we turned the pigs back to them. So we went back to our, our camp, and a few days, some of our Kachins were sent, so we went back to the uh, Kalak Ga then. Um, <clears throat> in the jungle, um, t tell me what a typical day would be like um, when you were there. Well, a typical day we was uh, on the march, and it was raining, and you was wet all over. I, I, got, I built a, they made me a bamboo hat I used later on. But the main thing we had to worry about, the leeches, there's like maggots in there. And they were everywhere, and they sucked the blood. Each one can suck about a tablespoon of blood out of you. 
And uh, that was the main thing that leeches, uh, they just eat you alive. And we had to worry about the crot too. A crot was a snake that would drop in and kill you in a few minutes. Cobras, they would use your, wouldn't attack you unless you got them hemmed up. And tigers, they wouldn't bother unless they was hungry. Thank goodness they wasn't hungry. So we went back to Gap Guy. What a, what worried you more, the the uh, the Japanese or all the animals? Uh, well, you never knew when you'd be ambushed. That's something we never knew. But we had our informers out, you know, ahead of us. Uh, after I was at the Gap Guy, they were still being like, more and more troops was coming in, and they sent us to a place called Shimbuyang. That was in no man's land. And that's where I'll tell you the, the book had just come out. National Geographic just published a book this month. It's April. And it's telling about that part of the jungle is the most dense and more animals there, second largest in the world. They have more tigers than elephants there in any place. And I, I went into Shimbuyang, and there was uh, the refugees tried to come out through, and lots of them died of starvation, fever, and that's where about 2,000 of them died there. Each lean-to, a lean-to is what we built to sleep in every night, and they were five and six and ten skeletons in each uh, hut there. And I never had seen so many dead bodies in my life. That was called uh, the Valley of Death. And uh, there was lots of jewelry. I collected some of the jewelry off the skeletons. That ring, and I got some diamonds I got out of different things. But uh, while we was there, uh, they sent us uh, three more guys. There's four of us, Tuggle, Reese, and Tuggle. And uh, they got a radio. We had our radio with us. We got had to check in twice a day. And they said they sent us an engineer to go to Shiraga to map out that village, see if it was a suitable place for landing. And they sent two more rangers with them, Duncan and uh, Duncan and um, Allwine. And uh, I went back and met them and brought them back to our camp. And they was going on that mission, Shiraga, and we was going on another one. And we were supposed to meet back in about three or four days. So they went on their mission and... Uh, we went on ours, and we come back, they wasn't there. But some of the natives with them, we t sent 12 of our first-class natives with them, and they come back, and on their way back, they went to Shirogar and mapped the location, but the Japs were as thick as horse flies in there. And uh, coming back, the Kachins warned them not to stay on the trail, and they stayed off, but they, they didn't, and they were ambushed coming back. And Brown, the one that was the engineer from the 900th Airborne Engineer, he was killed. And Duncan and uh, Albine, they uh, didn't know what happened to them. And the natives hid to it, and they watched it. They come back and found uh, Brown's body, and they searched it for information. And then they pulled out their dolls, their knives, and the Japs ordered the Shans, which was the natives there, and they cut his hands, feet, and head off. And they staked his head. They cut a piece of bamboo and staked his head on it, carried it back to our village, and, and uh, displayed his head and said, if any of the natives helped us, we'd have the same fate. Uh, Duncan, they found his body two weeks later. They don't know how he died, where he was shot or nothing. And all wine, they never found his body. But uh, I saw Brown's uh, body later on, and that's a horrible sight to see a guy's hands, head, and feet cut off, and it stayed on my mind for quite a while. Um, <clears throat> what kind of uh, communication did you have with your folks and family back home during this time? A uh, V-mail is the only communication we had. At first, we had runners that would take it out, but it took a month or two from the get out. Then we had Piper Cubs that were coming our snatch wire and snatch hour. And the way we got mail, they'd drop our supplies to us in a parachute, and it would have mail on the side of it. And it, to see a parachute come down like that was like something from heaven because you didn't hear from them too often. 
but V-mail is what we used. I have some V-mail at the house. If you'd like some for the museum, I got some extra. Um, what about um, other actions in the Pacific and in Europe, for that matter? How much word did you get about them, and did you even really think or care about them? Uh, when we would uh, radio in on D-Day, uh, invasion of Europe, uh, we got word they had invasion, you know, Normandy. And guy on the other end of the radio, he told us that, you know, typed it out in code. We sent code, you know. That's all the communication we had. Outside of that, we didn't have no, uh, you know, outside where we was back there, no man's land, and we had very little communication. Every day was alike. Sunday from Saturday, you never knew the day of the week. Um, what kind of medical care did you get? Uh, they give us medical kits, uh, all kinds of medical kits to carry with us uh, for taking sores. You know, leech, uh, if he bites you, if you pull, him, uh, pull it off before he finishes, they'll leave his head under. They call it nogger sores. It makes a bad sore. So you had to be careful of leeches. There's like maggots in there, but the leeches was the worst thing you had to deal with. And we had adabrain and quinine we carried with us. But as far as doctors, we didn't have no doctors with us. Well, one time uh, I got, my throat got sore and I couldn't swallow and I didn't know what I was going to do. And this Kachin I was with, his daddy in a nearby village, he come over, an old guy, and uh, he looked at my throat and uh, he went back out in the jungle, dug up some roots, and then he dug some uh, slimy vines, and he come back and he boiled the roots, and uh, he told me to goggle at them. The other guy said, you're crazy, he'll kill you, you know, but I said, well, I got to do something. And I goggled at him, and he wrapped them bamboo vines around my neck, and two days it was cured. And so uh, the old chief was happy, but not nearly as happy as I was. So they had dropped us some long-handled underwears with a flap on the back, four, three buttons, you know, where you button up. And I gave him some opium and cigarettes. They all like cigarettes. And he was happy as a kid on Christmas getting them long-handles. And he'd come to see me the next day and thank me for everything. And when he left, his flap was down the back. He didn't know you buttoned it up. You know, his whole rear end was showing. <laughs> um... Were you still in the jungle on uh, VJ Day? Uh, VJ Day uh, in 45, after European to England, you know, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, they, when Europe, the, the Germans surrendered. Uh, see, I'd been in now nearly four and a half years. I left here in July. I was gone three years before I got back home. And they called me in one night and said, uh, uh, would you like to go home? I said, "There's on high points. Anybody had 85 or more points were shipped back to the States and discharged. And they said, would you like to go back home? I said, are you kidding? Because I'd been over there so long, I didn't think I was going to ever get home. So they uh, contacted me, told me I was going home. There was about 18 more guys with me, and they flew us back to uh, Michinoff, from Michinoff to Calcutta. And I stayed there a few weeks, and they put us on a train and carried us to Karaki, Pakistan. And from there, there was 8,000 waiting to go home. And they told me it might be two or three weeks or a month before I'd go, but my name was the third one called. So I left there, uh, I guess, May 45, fly back to the States. But while I was in that uh, Hukun Valley, we got orders that in the, in the meantime, at Shimbiyang, the Chinese made their big push under Steelwell to retake Burma, and they went on down to Nigam Kassan. And we went in there that night. There was Chinese was running everywhere. Uh, Chinese is poorly trained. They round them up like cattle. But right after that, we left... Uh, we had to go in the mission. They needed information where the Japs were. They sent us back of the lines again. And we went to a village deep in enemy territory. And uh, that's uh, 
where I was going to spend Thanksgiving Day. But on Thanksgiving Day, the Kachins uh, killed a barking deer for us to eat because we eat lots of barking deer and animals and fish and stuff like that. And on Thanksgiving Day, we'd roasted our deer and was going to eat it. And that's when the Japs, they found out about us and they come in there to wipe us out. But the Kachins just saw them and give them the notice that the Japs was coming to kill us. There's some of the booby traps that went over. We set booby traps and pits of bamboo, what we use, poochie sticks, you call it. So we didn't have time to get nothing. We grabbed our radio, our guns. We didn't have time to get our cooking utensils or nothing. And uh, the Japs coming on us, we fought our way back down to the Chinwin River, and we went across the head of them. And when we crossed the river, uh, Colonel Wilson and Tuggle and McCuller was with me then. And uh, we set up an ambush across the river. We had two brim guns. That's British brim guns we used. We used a lot of assorted different rifles. We set up an ambush across the river, and we waited for the Japs. And when they reached the river, we didn't open them up on them until uh, they got in the middle of the stream. We opened up on them with brim guns and rifles. I don't know how many we killed. And then we dropped back again, and that went on for several days. And like I say, we had to leave in such a rush, we left our generator. They had a hand generator for our radio, so we had no communications at all back then. We was really cut off and didn't know. And uh, that went on for a few days. We'd set up an ambush and fall back, and the Japs was chasing us. And uh, one day we was going out across the paddy field, and... Uh, all at once, two planes come over. We thought there was Jap planes. Then we realized there was American planes. But the way we dressed, I dressed in native clothes and bamboo hats, and you couldn't tell where I was American. Of course, I was taller than them. We waved at the Americans, saying, don't shoot us, don't shoot us. We're Americans, you know. But uh, they made two or three paces, and we expect to be killed any moment. We, wished back, we rushed back into the jungle, and we heard them strafing the uh, Japanese. So uh, we hid there and built us lean tos for the night, and then we went come back down the Chemwin River. And like I say, we had no food at all back then. We had to eat native foods. We eat uh, fish, baked, eat monkey meat, barking deer, and we found a village and got us some rice. And we cooked uh, our rice in green bamboo. You can take a piece of bamboo, a section of it. And you can cook rice in there. And uh, they put all of our food on a banana leaf. And I got tired of eating uh, on a banana leaf, so I asked the Kachins to make me a spoon. So they made me a spoon. I'll show it. This is actually a spoon that I used to eat my rice in uh, and jungle food. And we cooked on the open air, and we had tea that they called pull-up, called pull-up coke long now, that's a cup of hot tea. And this is a bamboo cup they made out for us to drink a hot tea out of it. That's weave bamboo. This is a section of bamboo cut and cut off, and they've they done beautiful work. But that's actually things I used for survival back there. Back there. And in the villages, when we uh, wasn't Tied up, they made this bamboo ball that's weaved out of bamboo. We'd kick it back and forth. And that's what we used for survival back there. But uh, a few days later, we was going to cross the Chimwin River. We hadn't seen no sign of the Japs in these since they had strafed them. The Jap our planes had strafed them. We were run into a herd of wild elephants. There was tigers and elephants in there everywhere. And one of the Kachins accidentally shot one of the uh, elephants, and they made a howl, and they left. And the Kachins, they were scared. They asked them what was the matter. They said, Magui Sana, Magui Sana, elephant come back and kill you. And we thought there was some kind of native superstitious. And uh, we built our lean tos. The lean tos was built out of bamboo. To everything was built out of bamboo. The huts and mats, they used a block of uh, bamboo for a pillar. But uh, that night we built our fire and was cooking our meal, and we heard the elephants coming back. And uh, they said, Magui, Magui. 
So I didn't understand much language, and I learned to speak their language while I was over there, but I didn't know too much then. And the elephants was coming back to attack our camp, so we waited around a while. They built fires. Colonel Wilkes went and seen the Japs, so we built big fires. And uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning, we climbed big trees up over the river. We figured, well, if they knock the tree down, we'll swim the other side. I didn't know they could swim. And about 2 o'clock, they stampeded our camp. And uh, they tore up everything in there. But everything back in there is made out of bamboo. The uh, I'll show you a picture of a, a bridge here. We Back in 44, we destroyed this bridge. It's like the bridge on the River Choir. And uh, this bed, they built this bridge here with a cross on it. It's made out of nothing but bamboo and vines. There's not a piece of metal in it. But they can make everything out of bamboo. And you can eat bamboo shoots when they're real small. They're good. But uh, bamboo is a main thing in there. Tell but us anyway, about, tell us about the other picture. Huh? Tell us about well, the other picture. Well, uh, I'll, I'll continue that. Okay. Uh, after about 30 days, I went back at every days. We lived off the land, run into some more wild elves, but they didn't attack us like them because we didn't wound it. But uh, that night when the elephants attacked us, I was up that tree. That's the scariest I've ever been in my life. I could feel cold chills go up my spine, out my top of my head. But after about 30 days, we cut our way back into the met a Chinese patrol, and we went back to Ningham, and uh, they'd give us up for dead because we hadn't had no communication for 30 days, so they just knew we was dead. And when I went back into Chimbuyang, Burma, the war correspondent was there. There was all kind of war correspondents there wanting stories, and they wanted to make a picture of us, and they made about 100 pictures of us. And this is one of the pictures they made uh, uh, around Christmas 1943. Uh, that's our band of Kachins I work with. That's me, and that's Davenport there. But that was... Uh, I went to Calcutta later on. It was in the headlines of the Calcutta paper, and it made all the papers back in the States. News Map, Argosy Magazine made hundreds of magazines. And if you buy World War II a book now, that picture will be in there. And some of the pictures are made on the History Channel. I'm a, I got two pictures of me on the History Channel. Mm. But in, four, in 95, uh, San Francisco Presidio Museum, they put this picture in the Hall of Fame, and later on they made a poster on it. I think they made a poster on that last thing. Uh, but it's well published. It's still published. And a book come out last year called Burma Road, mm -hmm. and uh, they got my, this picture, and it got an article on me in there. But it's in hundreds of history books, that picture. But that's the reason it was made when we was cut off our back of the lines, and they, they thought we was dead. That's the story on the Picture. Yeah, it's hard. I got the tape on it. You feel? Uh -huh. Want to make one for me? Okay. Well, mm. get a, and that's what? my book. You know, I published. I guess you know about right. it. I gave one to the museum. Yeah, I've actually I've looked at it. I've read I've read that book. But I'll show with the joy on this Jap flag and. Uh, Y'all ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, mm. So go ahead, go ahead and tell the, the monkey story. Well, I forgot to tell about the monkeys. They're always in the Hukun Valley. The, the natives brought us a, a monkey for a pet. <clears throat> right after we got the monkey, uh, Tuggle, that guy that was swimming, his toothbrush was dirty every morning, sort of yellow looking. And he said, anybody been fooling around my toothbrush? We kept off a toothbrush hanging on a bamboo hook. He said, no. And that went on for days. He'd have a dirty toothbrush every morning. And one morning he got up early, and that old monkey had his toothbrush scratching his behind with it. So uh, Tuggle shot the monkey, and that cleared the dirty toothbrush. He never did have another dirty toothbrush. Um, let's see. Uh, go ahead and, and tell me about the, the Japanese flag. Well, in the Battle of Mechina, uh, in 1944, I don't. Uh, most of you probably never heard of Merle's Marauders. Uh, they were 
captured me. They sent them in there in uh, 44, and I saw them all the way down, and I went through Super Boom up through there. We rescued lots of airmen. It was shot down. And in the Battle of Mechanai, it lasted. It started in May and lasted through August the 3rd. But I was in that battle most of the way, and this is one of the Jap flags I captured there. I captured three of them. I had a Jap battle vest, too. Uh, I got a picture made, but somebody stole it. And I got lots of stuff like that. I sold my other two Jap flags. The Air Corps offered me a hundred bucks a piece for them, and I couldn't turn it down. But I kept that one because I wanted to keep one of them to bring back home. But I got all kind of Jap stuff at the house I sent home. What a... Uh... How did you feel about the Japanese? Was it, I mean, emotionally and uh, thinking about them, just how did you feel about them? Well, uh, they were brutal. I mean, they did, they did, they had starved you, they wouldn't feed you, they're prisoners of war, and they would kill you without no hesitation. And you never know when you'd be ambushed on a trail, but we usually kept our informers out. We knew, kept track of them most of the time. But uh, they captured some of them, and they tortured them all. For we had we lost about eight, six or eight Americans in '43, and about 17 Kachins was killed. Of our men was killed, and but like I say, Brown was beheaded. We know he was beheaded because I saw his body later on. Did you hate them? Yeah, back then I did. <laughs> For the brutality, I really did. They were brutal. I believe they was more brutal than the Germans. Um, <clears throat> let me let me ask you just some more questions about the about later on. Okay. Um, well, I'll tell about going into China later on. That was later on. Okay. Um, uh, the atomic bomb. When the atomic bomb was dropped. Um, why did you think about that? Well, I thought it was a good idea because it saved lots of lives. If they'd had an invasion there, it would have uh, really taken its toll. And I think that was... I was back in the States when they dropped that, though. I'd already been back in the States. Um, what do you think of the recent controversy that has surrounded using the atomic bomb? Well, uh, most... Nations was against it, you know. We're against it now of them having it. But uh, at the time, I thought it was good that uh, Truman gave the okay to drop it. And uh, it saved a lot of lives, what I was thinking about. Because there had been thousands of Americans lost their lives as they had invaded Japan. So they had fight to the last man. And that made he was, uh, Tokyo surrendered, you know. They wouldn't have done that without that. Um, um, what did you do after the war? Well, after the war, I was discharged June the second, forty-five, and uh, everything had changed back here. I, I didn't realize what a rough time the people was having. And I had my GI shoes, and I went uptown to buy me a pair of shoes, and uh, I found a pair I liked, and I told the guy I'd take it. He said, well, "Where's your shoe stamps?" I said, "Shoe stamps? I didn't even know they had shoe stamps back then." But I found out you had to have stamps to buy gas or most everything you had. But I was uptown one day in the drugstore, and I was first time I'd put on civilian clothes, and there's two young kids come in there. They're in uniform, and they sat at the table next to me. I heard one of them say, look at that 4F over there, you know. <laughs> that was an insult, but I didn't say nothing to them, you know. But it took me a long time to get adjusted. I was real nervous. If a plane flew over the house, I'd jump out of bed and hit the floor. And uh, I, w I was real nervous. I was on the streetcar coming up from town one time, and a loud bust of thunder hit close by, and I jumped up on the streetcar and run the back up, and everybody only looked at me and said, that guy's nuts, you know. <laughs> but it was just, I was nervous. They told me, they gave me femur barbitol to take, but it took me about a year or two before I, and I never, you never completely get out of it, really. Um. How often, between the end of the war and now, uh, did you think about the war and your experiences during? Well, I uh, still think about it sometime, you know, dream about it. Sometime I drink, uh, dream I'm back over there, and I wonder how I got back over there. You know, it's, uh, But after the war, 
I took a job as an investigator, and then I worked for that for a while in the VA. And uh, in there, see, I had typhus, the most deadly fever you can have. And I had malaria, I was gassed, and I had several different things that happened to me. Um, all that, taking all that into account, um, what kind of impact did your time in service have on your life? Well, it made me appreciate lots of stuff I never would, and uh, I didn't try to get out of nothing. I volunteered for everything it was. I was crazy. Even when I had typhus, I was in Calcutta, and it kills 95% of them. They offered, the doctors offered to put me in an outfit in Calcutta, and I refused it. I went back to my outfit. I, I didn't try to. But uh, lots of guys would shoot themselves in the foot to keep them you know, going into combat, but I never did. I, and I was glad that I went in. I mean, we was fighting for a cause back then. I think World War II, if, if the Japs had invaded us, we'd be slaves today, probably. Um, that's the next question. What did uh, what do you think World War II meant to the nation as a whole? Well, uh, I really don't know the the answer thing, but it made you like me. I appreciate lots of things I didn't, and uh, before I went in, you know, and uh, made me afraid. I was proud to be an American because we have so so much better life than most of these people. Like India, there's starvation over there all the time. They're all over the streets by the hundreds begging. No mama, no papa, Bugsy Sob. You know, it's. Uh, Really sad to see some of these countries how they live. I was in about eighteen different countries. Um, what lessons do you hope future generations can take from your generation? Well, uh, most people in this country don't take for granted what a you know free country we live in. I, I guess it's free. Free in most of these countries because we have a lot of these politics I don't agree with, but uh, I think they, if they read history, most of these young kids they don't know nothing about. They don't even know about World War II or any other war. They don't read them. They don't teach them in school. Now I have one in uh, uh, in Florida. He's a history teacher. Uh, he teaches about World War II, and I get letters from his students every year. They write me a letter telling how much they appreciate what I've done. And I think it's wonderful to see young kids do that, you know. They send me pictures and letters. I got about 20 letters I got Christmas at the house. Um, what... Uh, since we're going to use this video in the exhibit, literally tens of thousands of kids are going to see it. So what do you want to tell them? Well, I want to tell them I just hope they never have to go in service like I did to fight a war, a World War II. And uh, I hope we live have a free country from now on. But uh, there's so many of our young men getting killed, and I hate to see them get killed. Even today they're getting killed over in Iraq. And I'd like to see us, if we're not attacked, to live in peace. And, uh, but you know, in uh, 44, after I had typhus and come back to Michinai, I was awarded the military citation for that battle. I was in Battle of Michinai. And uh, some major come to me, and uh, he learned that I could speak a chin and they wanted to send the first combat unit from Burma into China to open the Burma Road. See, the Burma Road, the Lido Road was joining that, but there's lots of Japs in there. So I volunteered to go with him on that mission into China. We went back in there deep in the Himalayan mountains, and we cleared out pockets of Japs. And uh, I know one time we was ambushed on a trail up there, and uh, there's bullets flying everywhere, and I was scared to death. And the bullet went through my canteen on my side before I got back to the rock and the water leaked out all over me. And I was so scared at the time that after the battle was over, I realized the water from the canteen was all over my, all over me, but I was so scared at the time I thought I'd wet my pants, you know. So uh, 
we opened that, the Burma Road, and they got supplies in there. But they, that was 45, though. The first convoy, they started carrying supplies into China for Chiang Kai-shek. I got the Chinese war medal from Chiang Kai-shek also. Um, as I'm sure you are all too aware, uh, a lot of focus seems to be on the European theater, not as much focus on the Japanese That's theater, right. and then absolutely none on the on the CBI. So we was the Forgotten Theater. It was known as the Forgotten Theater of War because we got very little publicity. And uh, never so few. Uh, Frank Sinatra made a picture in uh, Spode's been in Burma. I don't know where y'all ever seen it. Tell them about the Kachins. I wear. It's got real good pictures. I mean, it's like the river crossing there, the scenes they show in there. But... Uh, why do you think that was, and is, for that matter? Why is that? Why, why do you think people don't even think about it or bother to learn about it? Well, I don't know. I guess it's a different generation now. Oh, you take over where I was. We had access to opium, smoke it, but I never seen an American smoke it, opium, or any other dope. But in Vietnam, you know, a lot of them was on dope. But... Uh, Cigarettes in the jungle on supplies we got, only things we ever got was cigarettes and beer and cans of beer. And I didn't drink beer and I didn't smoke because so I was left out. But I traded my cigarettes for food, you know. That was a big item, cigarettes. You could, everybody smoked over there. And these natives, uh, we had coolies. Uh, they would smoke opium. And if they didn't have that open, they couldn't even walk, but they could take a shot of that and put 50 or 60 pound about and that walk you through the jungle. Um, <clears throat> here's a tender question. Um, how often, uh, away from uh, Western civilization, were, was the other sex on your mind? Well, uh, there wasn't that much but native girls in there. I know one time they dropped us about 12 dozen condoms, and I don't know what the heck they dropped them in there if we didn't have no use. So we give them to the natives. We made balloons out of them for them. We used them to keep our matches in, and we put them over the barrel of a gun to keep the water out. Now, the Kachins, the, if you went in a village and you could speak the language, they thought the world was there. And when I went into one village one time, the chief, he brought us two Kachin girls to sleep with them. We, we told him, no, we couldn't accept them. The major wouldn't allow us. And uh, there's one old boy from Louisiana. He like went crazy when he found out what they'd brought us, you know. <laughs> but uh, like I say, that, that is something you didn't have in there. Oh, there's lots of disease in there. But you thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, everybody thinks about it. <laughs> um. Probably in, in the theater you were at, there there weren't a lot of, of black units, were there? Uh, yeah, they had the uh, black engineers. They was total black. They had white officers. They helped build the Lido Burma Road. There was lots of them in there. So when I went into Cap Ga, uh, there was a John Allen there. He was a white lieutenant. He had uh, eight black soldiers with him. See, they dropped the food, and he had the quartermaster. He kept all the food in and they kept it in bamboo, but uh, they didn't have no fighting black in their combat fighting. It's all quartermaster or engineers building the Lido Road. Um, <clears throat> what, what factors do you think allow the United States to win World War II? Well, we had the power, I'd say, and know how to do it in contact with other nations. And you see, I've, uh, I've got a book here that I published on the war over there called Secret War in Burma. And I tell about the nations that joined us to fight and uh, the ones that was against us and everything. But uh, you could never tell who your friends was in the jungle. They might tell you they're a friend and they'd turn you in. And... Uh, that's that uh, picture that river crossing me crossing. It tells about when we met got cut off and
how we had to eat native food for about a month before we got back. But overall, I was with British Alliance. They were they were nice troops, but the only thing about them, they had to drop and have their tea at ten, two, and four. You know, I never had drink hot tea till I got with them. And uh, but they were real nice. I was with New Zealand's, Australians, uh, and uh, in the Battle of Michinaw, they brought in some South Africans, and uh, they were some tribe. They had big. Dashes cut in the cheek, and they were good fighters. And they had a thin, tall, light-colored black that was fought in there too. They was—I forget how many different nationalities fought during over there during World War Two. But uh, I had—I was under a Colonel Wilson for a while uh, in the B Force when I was in there. Um, B Force. Yeah. Where B. did you get that name? Well, uh, when they formed the. Uh, Kachin, uh, back in uh, 42, they called it, the, see, Wingate went in there in Long Range territory, and after the retreat of Burma, they had to have small units to go in there to collect the information, blow up bridges, and uh, ambush Japanese. And so when they formed it, they called it the B-Force. It was made up of natives. Say we'd have uh, 200 natives, about six or eight Americans and British. So that was called the V-Force. And the V-Force went from that to OSS, Office of Statistics Service, which uh, operated in Burma also. And they called the Chin, uh, I forget that British outfit they called over in the other section over there. I was with them for a while also. Uh, was, I, it the, was it the Chindits? Uh, they had this, some of the Chinnits in there. Let's see, they uh, Chinnits was a Broadway and Piccadilly, uh, below mention now, but they fought in there. General Slim, he was over the 14th British 14th Army. Wingate was killed in uh, 44, I think, 43 or 44. His his body's in Washington. I didn't know that till I was that about a few years ago. Now the World War II Museum opens in uh, this year, May the 29th. The big World War II museum, and uh, they picked 40 veterans from uh, Georgia to go, and I'm one of them they picked to go for the dedication of it. What do you think about uh, speaking of the of the memorial and all of that? What do you think about the recent upsurge um, in World War II based patriotism in the last five years? Well, I don't think it's as strong as it used to be, but I think this uh, war in Iraq has brought back a lots of uh, people to thinking a little different from what they did, you know. They was really patriotic during World War II, but uh, when I come home, I didn't get no parade or nothing. I was discharged out here at Fort Mac because I was inducted at Fort Mac Pierce and then discharged. And they had CC barracks we stayed in while I was out there. They didn't even have barracks for us. But I'll never forget the when I first inducted me, uh, I was going through the line to get my clothing, and they threw me out of uniform. I didn't weigh about 130 pounds, 25 or 30, but he threw me out a pair of pants and shirt. It was big enough, twice as big, and I said, hey, bud, these clothes are too large. But he come over to me, he said, listen, soldier, you're in the Army. and said, don't you call me bird no more, uh, bud no more. You call me sir when you speak to me. So I'd been in the Army five minutes, but I'd already been chewed out, you know. Um, how much do we have left on the tape? Uh, about 12 minutes. Okay. Um, Well, in China, you know, they, they round up the troops over there. It's really uh, Chinese. Some of the Chinese were barefooted. And, uh, some uh, war correspondent asked a Chinese one time, said, what do you do to your men when they freeze under power? He said, we shoot them. And that was so. Right after I got to Gap God, they brought in three Chinese with the yokes around their hands tied. And I thought they were Japanese. I never could tell them apart. And, uh, of course, the Chinese are a little taller. And they had deserted, and I saw them up there on the hill later working. I thought they had them on deep. They were digging their grave. They shot them. And uh, death's cheap. Well, there's a guy contacted me the other day. He's writing a book on the Chinese, and he wanted some of my pictures, and I sent him some of them without the American equipment on. 
But I learned to speak some Chinese. The first word I learned was nago. That means halt. And I said, well, me go bing. I'm an American soldier. Don't shoot me. Because <laughs> they'd shoot you sometime. Did you, uh, <coughs> when you were uh, there, did you interact with the nationalist and the communist Chinese? No. Just that was in China. Okay. The, the communist, uh, my two song was under the communist. Now, there's both fighting the... Uh, uh, Japanese, but there was friction there, and you know, they overthrew the government, Chiang Kai-shek, and he went to Taiwan, and that's where Taiwan is today. That's a different nation from uh, main China, red China. And uh, I didn't have no contact, but some of the guys I worked with, Collins, uh, he went with uh, my two sons, and John Birch, you know, the John Birch Society, he was a guerrilla fighter in. Uh, China also, and he was killed 11 days after the war. Not by the Japanese, but the Chinese communists. Um, this, this may be a silly question. Do you, uh, do you ever miss being in the jungle? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, that that jungle is one of the roughest jungles on that. Even the guys that was in the Pacific, the Merle Marauder said it was the roughest jungle he was ever in. And uh, the National Geographic, like I say, they tell about it. This, but they named the place I was at all the time, Shimmer Yang, where all the bodies was, you know. And uh, I forget how many died in there. But your lean tos, they're built out of bamboo too and banana leaves. I don't know what they'd do without bamboo and banana leaves. They use it for water containers, cooking, they use it for everything. Fish traps. Now they uh, uh fish uh, wouldn't buy it with hooks over there, but you could take a hand grenade and throw it in one of the streams and get all the fish you could eat. We used hand grenades a lot, for saliva. But when I was cut off back there. Um, and you used and the area you were operating in, you depended a lot on British supplies, right? Yeah, we had uh, British uh, brim guns, and rifles, lots of them was British. The natives wore lots of British clothes. I even wore British clothes one time over in that area, Super Boom area, when Fort Harris, that's right on the China border. Well, um, I think we've covered about everything I need. Is there is there any last words you'd like to uh, to tell us? Well, I don't think uh, most of the kids this damn time really knows about World War II. They might read about a little bit, but they don't realize what a war is like. Most people don't realize what a war is like. But the civilians of them countries are the ones that uh, really suffers most because they have no food, no way of getting it, and uh, we give them lots of stuff. But uh, I think. Uh, they should teach it more in school, which they don't. And uh, they don't war as hell for any. And it wrecks your nerves. You never, you're never the same. You're never the same person you are when you go in. And I'm proud to be an American. All right. I think I need to say anything else than that. No. So, um, I guess that's it. Okay. With me.